the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day, and thank you again for the opportunity for us to study your Psalms, the prayer book that you have given us. Open our hearts and minds to see where to go when we long to continue growing in the Lord and what to say when we acknowledge your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are going to start in... Where did I say we're going to start? I think we're starting at 60... No, that's not right. 65? Yeah, 65. That's where we're at. Okay. So I'm going to read Alter's translation again. And I think we'll do, what is that, three or four sections? Eight and nine. Psalm 65. Is that what? Uh, Psalm 119, verse 65. Yeah, that's right. So one, two, three, four. four. 65. 65. Good you have done for your servant, O Lord, as befits your word. Good insight and knowledge teach me, for in your commands I trust. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now your utterance I observe. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant plaster me with lies. I with whole heart keep your decrees. Their heart grows dull like fat. As for me, in your teaching I delight. It was good for me that I was afflicted so that I might learn your statutes. Better for me, your mouth's teaching, than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Your hands made me and set me firm. Give me insight that I may learn your commands. Those who fear you see me and rejoice, for I hope for your word. I know, Lord, that your laws are just, and in faithfulness you did afflict me. May your kindness, pray, console me, as befits your utterance to your servant. May your mercies befall me that I may live, for your teaching is my delight. May the arrogant be shamed, for with lies they distorted my name. As for me, I shall dwell on your decrees. May those who fear you turn back to me and those who know your precepts. May my heart be blameless in your statutes so that I be not shamed. I will stop there. Okay, so I gotta make myself a note around where we're at. There we go. Okay, so everything that's worth doing is worth doing well. No, everything that's worth doing costs something, uh, whether it be money or our time or our commitment, uh, our service that we give, or some other kind of payment. Uh, And that is also true with our Christian growth and our maturity and our godliness. And we always will say that we want to grow as believers and we want to become more mature in the faith, become more Christ-like. But do we understand what that requires? And it's going to sound like I'm talking about works righteousness. So I'll just stop right there and say this is not about works righteousness. The cost was Christ's life for us on the cross. Uh, But some of the lessons that we have to learn in life, like anything, have to come with hardship. Usually you don't learn your lesson until you are afflicted. We can see that the psalmist is talking about affliction in these passages we're looking at tonight. and I think we even touched on it in the sermon last Sunday, I think it was last Sunday. We talked about how you know, when the going is good, sometimes we don't always remember the Lord like we should. But when the going gets tough, even, yeah, that was last Sunday, even, you know, we've even heard atheists say, you know, kind of whisper, God help me, mm-hmm. when it gets really bad. All of, all of a sudden, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, we might have a problem with that. It's like, oh, all of a sudden, now that life's bad, all of a sudden you believe in God. Well, yeah. Yeah, when you've got nowhere else to turn, he's there. And he expects that, you know, because it's what we do. When we suffer, we turn to God and we get some alleviation of that suffering, however it may come. Um, but sometimes it takes the, the tough things and the bad things to turn us toward him. 
And again, Psalm 119 was written when whoever the psalmist is uh, wrote, was going through a time of, of affliction. And then the Spirit uh, moved him to write this psalm. And because of his faithfulness to the word, he was suffering affliction from all around him, which is why it really sounds like King David, because Israel was surrounded by like five kingdoms that all hated them, uh, that all at one time or another tried to take them hostage or persecute them. Uh, so being the king of Israel was not an easy job. And then when we look through this passage today, it's the Hebrew letter Teth. Uh, just to keep up with what letter we're on. Um, he recognizes what God has done through this affliction, and then he confesses that that affliction was good for him. You know, the affliction, nobody likes going through it, nobody likes pain, nobody likes suffering. But when you come out the other side of it with the Lord, and then you see, okay, that affliction was good for me, it strengthened my faith, it renewed my faith, whatever it, whatever it does for us. Uh, and then we realize that God works through such things. He doesn't make the bad things happen. Um, he, you know, when we're talking to other people, you know, that's most often the question you're going to get is, okay, if God is a loving God, why does he let bad things happen? Well, it's not that he's letting bad things happen. He created the world. We fell into sin. Sin fills the world, and sin makes the bad things happen. Uh, if he just made it go away, would we have any faith at all? Or how soon would it take before we forgot them like the people of Israel forgot? You know, they, they marched through the wilderness for 40 years and they all along the way kept forgetting about him. Then they finally reached the promised land and then they want to be like everybody else around them. Oh, we want kings. Oh, we want judges. Oh, we want kings. Oh, we're going to do this and that. And then, then, you know, comes, we're reading Nehemiah in morning prayer. And then, you know, along comes Nehemiah. And, oh, here's the book of the law. Let's read this in public. And everybody's like tearing their clothes and rubbing dirt on their face because, oh, we have abandoned the Lord. And then they try to turn over a new leaf and that doesn't last. So, you know, when, if God just made all the pain and suffering go away, would we turn to him? And as parents, He may do we, not want it to happen but he doesn't no. allow it to happen. Right, exactly. I mean, he's not making the bad things happen and he doesn't like seeing his children suffer, but he will use it to meet his good ends. So he will use it to work his will one way or another. And, you know, just like parents, right? When you're raising kids, you can't protect them from everything. You don't want to protect them from everything. Sometimes they got to stub their toe. Sometimes, you know, don't touch that, it's hot. Don't touch that, it's hot. Ow, I burn my hand on the stove because it's hot. And it's like, well, <coughs> what did I tell you? Don't do that. Okay, and then you kiss it, make it better, and then they do it again. They eventually learn, most of us eventually learn not to touch the stove. And I just did that like the other day. <laughs> you know, they had a pan, pan, the handle was hot. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I can remember that's hot. And then I got to doing something else and walk right up and grab the pan. I'm just like, oh, like cane on kung fu, carrying the hot pot. Oh. It's still hot. Huh? It's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's still hot, dummy. Sometimes we have to remember that we can't appreciate joy unless we have affliction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And you only have to look to Paul to, uh, to get that, too. If we look at, oh, yeah, let's look at Philippians. So I was sharing that with somebody this week. The book I can never find. I know it's the inflation people which uh, Philippians. I always go too far. Uh, it's Philippians 1, I want to say. <clears throat> Why are these pages so thin? I... Uh, anyway, Philippians 1, uh, I think. Was talking about oh, come on. maybe I think it was last Sunday's epistle lesson too. Now I gotta find it. Figures. It was Paul was writing it at a time where he didn't know if he was ever going to see these people again, or if this was going to be it, if this was when he was going to meet his end. 
And he was talking about how basically either way he's good with it. And then that's where you see, okay, Paul's a good example of how to, how to live in affliction. Am I looking right at it? talking about that. Um, wow, I really should have wrote that down. Uh, verse 17. Yes, I am being, again, being poured, I am being poured out like a drink offering. Yeah, that's it. Sacrifice and service of your faith. That is it. I am glad and joyful with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Yeah, so go back to verse 12. So he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God. You're right, that is the section. Uh, and talks briefly about why they are preaching. But then... Yeah, so around verse 21. So for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, but if I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner, a manner worthy of the gospel. And, you know, this is another of his prison letters. So he's not sure. Is he going to be executed this time or not? And he goes, well, on the one hand, what I really want to do is go be with Christ now. So let it be over. Let me go be with Christ forever. But on the other hand, if I'm going to be here and I can keep preaching the gospel, I got you guys to take care of. And that's good too. So he's like, no matter what, it's a good thing. Uh, I don't know how many of us would actually be able to do that. You know, it's like, okay, I'm in prison. Don't know what's going to happen. This could be it. I'm going to start thinking about myself and selfish stuff. That's probably what I'm going to do. I don't know. Uh, so sharing with someone in, in a circumstance where things were a little out of their control at the moment uh, and had no choice in the matter, uh, some actions that they had done got them to where they are, uh, but the full outcome is unknown. And talking about how this person still has an opportunity to share the gospel with people. Uh, even in that place, uh, you don't know. You didn't know what was going to happen. Is it going to be over in a few weeks, or is this going to keep going on and on? And I can't say any more because it's giving away who it is. Uh, it's someone we, we may know. And just that the way Paul is so joyful that, okay, if I die, that's good. And if I don't die, that's good too. <laughs> and it's just, okay, you, we can do that too. Whatever circumstance we're in, what are the opportunities we have? And then in the, in the psalm, what, what with the afflictions that we have, what opportunity, what is God trying to show us? How is God trying to turn us back to him? You know, basically, because it's all going to boil down to how is God using this affliction to show me my sin? And then how do I repent of that and turn back toward him? Uh, talking about our putting our foot in our mouth and God being a loving parent. Uh, if he were not, 
And sometimes, as a parent, we let the kids have what they want. They keep adding that as long as it's not going to hurt. Mm -hmm. Keep adding, let them have. <laughs> and if God were not a merciful God and a loving Father, we would only have 64 books in the Bible because they had a judge and they wanted kings. Mm -hmm. Samuel tried to talk them out of it, and so they, they gave him a king. So they. <laughs> Oh, if he had it, we wouldn't have the book for the same case. We, you know. Right. So, loving thoughts. All good, some were bad. But I didn't buy kind of quirky <laughs> commentary, but it just, I only that came to one day. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's like God knows what's good for you, and they're like, well, okay, we want this. And I'm like, okay, you're not going to like this one bit, exactly. but okay, here you go. Exactly. See what lesson you learn from that. But, you know, it's like, you know, you look at, a prophet like Jeremiah, who nobody listened to one word he said, is like, what a miserable job that was to be that to be him. It's like, okay, Lord, I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep prophesying. None of these people are listening to a single thing I say. Okay, keep you're still a prophet, keep doing your job. Okay. Preach, preach, preach. Nobody is listening to me. It's like I I'm not very happy. He couldn't even get married, so he couldn't even go home and no, I mean yeah, it's just that's got to be a soul-crushing existence to know you're doing what you're called and to know none of them, it's not penetrating any of them. That's, that's, a, tough, that's a tough one to take on. So here in verse, uh, it's good to write. Jesus had the same thing with the Pharisees. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they were so blind to see, what, they couldn't see what was right in front of them. Yeah. And that's, that's what he was so upset about. It was just the, the pure hypocrisy. Okay, so the psalmist right here in 65, first thing he does, and I mean, this is another good pattern for us for prayer. Okay, we, he acknowledges God's goodness. So he's suffering this anguish of persecution. He recognizes God's goodness in his life. And he sees that God has kept his word faithfully. You know, and then God has strengthened his confidence and through his suffering, his life is purified, which is a, a leap. But um, when his confidence in God's word, when our confidence in God's word is strengthened, then we know that the suffering we go through is a purification because it, it again, shows us our sin, turns us in repentance toward him. And then we can see how he uses those unfortunate things in our lives to do something good for us. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the ultimate bad thing that happened that did the ultimate good is called the scandal of the cross. You know, someone who is crucified is beneath contempt in, in that society. God used the absolute worst punishment that humans had conceived of at the time, uh, probably still the worst they can conceive of, uh, and subjected his son to it for the, for the you know, atonement of the entire world. So that's the scandal of the cross, that this horrible, horrible thing was worked to you to use to work the greatest possible good for us through his will. Uh, and then anything else is just a little miniature version of that. So, you know, Christ was humiliated and crucified, and then when we uh, see bad things in our life used to good, do something good for us spiritually, it's supposed to make you think of the ultimate bad thing that was done for the ultimate good thing to point you back to the cry, back to the cross. I like the way you read verse, uh, your emphasis on verse 68. You are good and do good, putting emphasis on, you know, the... Uh, yeah. yeah. And could you read it, you are good or you do good, you know, but when you put the emphasis on, you know, the word that way, it puts a little more depth to the... Yeah, yeah it's like we, you know, we have that list of names for God in our head, and you know, good mm -hmm. is one of them. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you are good, and it's just like God is love. Mm -hmm. So, what's He going to do? What He's going to do is going to be out of love, uh, no matter what. Okay, so to go through our example prayer that we're all writing in our heads. So the psalmist thanks God for fulfilling his promises <coughs> in his life. He glorifies God. Even though he's bent over by affliction, he is you know, straightened up and, and you know, no longer bent by affliction when he acknowledges 
you know, God's goodness to him that he always fulfills his promises. So he's able to see beyond the here and now bad things. You know, like, like right now, we're all trying to see beyond this stupid virus and when it's going to go away so life can get back to normal. And realize this was over six months now we've been doing this, and it's weird. And it's also, that's what we do now, right? So we're, you know, we're looking for a time beyond this that things are going to be, be less weird you know, and less dangerous for, for a lot of people. Uh, so he looks past his suffering to all the good things that God has done for him through that suffering. And then I think what NIV has do good to your servant, if somebody's reading that in verse 65. And then uh, King James has dealt. Mm-hmm. And then uh, New American Standard has dealt. Uh, what's the Greek have? Probably something pretty close to that. Sixty-five. Let's see. Sixty-six. Verse seventy. Yeah, that which is good, you did. Yeah. Verse seventy. What? What did your? Uh... Seventy. Uh, their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. Is what my Bible has. Oh, okay. And then says, yeah. It, altars their heart has. Their fat is grease. Is what this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. uh, Yeah, their heart grows dull like fat. So yeah, instead of covered with fat, your heart grows dull like fat, is what uh, Alter has. Uh, As for me, in your teaching, I delight, but I delight in your law. Something similar is what ours has. Yeah, his Alter's translation is a little more picturesque. Picturesque, how do you say that? Picturesque sometimes. Um, because he's really treating it like the poetry it is, being you know Jewish himself. Okay, so now he's acknowledged and thanks God for filling his promises and for working uh, good through suffering. And then he asks again to be taught. You know, teach me. You know, teach me according to your word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, or knowledge and good judgment. Like King James probably has good judgment. So God's worked this for me. I don't want to miss out on anything else God has to teach me because, okay, this got me through. What else has God got for me? What else can he tell me or remind me that I've forgotten? Uh, so that he acknowledges you know, his confession. I believe your commandments. You know, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word, which... Mm. Yeah, it didn't feel so good. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, we always got to watch in the Old Testament too when it says, when they say, you know, oh Lord, we keep your word. Doesn't literally mean they think they're keeping the commandments perfectly. They don't think that. You know, it means, okay, we know, we know what we're supposed to do and we're acknowledging. Basically, it's an unsaid way of saying we acknowledge our sin that we don't do this perfectly, but we're trying. We're trying. We're trying to keep the commandments. It's kind of like, Again, uh, the uh, rich young man, when Jesus was talking to him, he goes, okay, Jesus says, hey, you know the commandments, and he rattles off all the second table of the law, all the things you're supposed to do for your neighbor. And this guy goes, oh, well, you know, I've done that since I was a child. And Jesus is just like, you just picture him going, yeah, no, no, you haven't, no. But Okay. Uh, and then he got to the heart of the matter. It's like, okay, what's the, the thing is, give away all your stuff. Oh, uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. And so he left. It's like, okay, so I guess you didn't keep all the commandments. But So the big acknowledgement here is verse 67. I think that's like the peak verse of this section. You know, before I was afflicted, I went astray. That's what I was talking about at the beginning. It's like, yeah, when everything's going good, hey, we're cruising. We're, we're okay. I, we kind of put God on the shelf sometimes till we need him, and then we take him down again. Help. And sometimes you don't know it. No. You think it's going along. Well, it's like... Swimmingly, and then all of a sudden, it's like... It's like the, the, the little things that 
develop into a new bad habit or the good habits that we have, it's really easy for them to not be habits anymore. Like, you know, I know the, all the pastors are talking about this, that, okay, we know we've lost some people. They're, we, they're calling it ghosting, where you just know people that, yeah, this has really got them rattled, even though we're back in person and we have parking lot and online. We've we just lost people. You can't get them on the phone. They're not answering the phone. They've just kind of isolated themselves. And where was I going with that? So, you know, people are just kind of, that's their new world, is this kind of cocoon where they've really hyper-insulated themselves from everybody else. And that's going to be a hard habit to get out of. That's their new, where they were in church every Sunday and, and doing things, you know, they had a routine. This is the new routine. The new routine is, is you know, really isolating yourself, even when it's no longer necessary for the reasons that this all started. Uh, for some, yeah, they do have good reason for that. But others that are perfectly healthy and not at high risk have just absented themselves from the community. Um, as an ex could be just an excuse, and I, I think it is in a lot of cases. But uh, that's become the new habit. That was a real easy habit. It didn't take long to slip into that. When you look at folks that maybe they've really never missed a Sunday unless they were sick for decades, and all of a sudden they're gone, and you cannot get a hold of them. You know, so that's a willful separation. How the devil is using that to his benefit, we can probably see pretty well. But, you know, that, and that's going to be a tough nut to crack to get some of those folks back. And some say, and I write on the church that I've been affiliated with, that actually we've grown. We have, we have uh, infected like 12 new people, you know, new families that just, mm -hmm. uh, I think one visited maybe twice before. The, and then a, a month ago, or about six weeks ago, we had baptisms. Went to the feed store, got a big water. Yeah. <laughs> and nice. We don't, and the, one, the beautiful thing about that was 13, I think 11 of them were, were young people, you know, teenagers and tweens. Nice. And uh, and it was just beautiful to see that. And they thought so it was the neatest thing, you know, getting baptized in a water trough, you know. <laughs> but it was, it was great. It was, you know, it was real. So, you know, I, what you're saying, yeah, there's some that, we have lost, but by the same token, we're kind of growing on the other Yeah, and, and you know, that, that, is, that is also true. It's like, you know, you guys, people follow, followed us in from outside. And it's like, that's cool. You know, uh, different places. Uh, so, yeah, we, we tend to, and maybe I'm guilty of that a little bit too, is we tend to put blinders on and we only see what's going on right here. But you know what? There's good things to, happening here too. There's, there's good and bad things as in all things, right? But yeah, there's... There are stories of just remarkable things happening. People that uh, haven't gone to church and forever all of a sudden are going, you know, to different ones. And like, okay, whatever this shocked them into turning back to God, that's wonderful. It's one way he's using it. Yeah. The pastor even has said that uh, it's kind of one part of it has been a, a wonderful experience for him to being uh, networking with other pastors that you wouldn't see, talk to, or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, but, and how you get ideas of what works for your congregation, but doesn't work, you know, oh, yeah. it, it had, he's been, was remarked about what a wonderful, you know, God doesn't do it, he's, he's got to be glorified, it's no matter what we think, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, the shepherds and the, and the sheep are, we're still being shepherded, but uh, I can imagine in your position when you have this, all of this to do, especially you've got two congregations, but the networking of, of pastors has really been a big help to him. Yeah, and the, the, the interesting thing, too, is, is, you know, they're learning, we're learning a lot of new skills mm -hmm. that we maybe didn't have before, like trying to stream and editing video that we've never done before. And you realize, you know, once you get this figured out, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. And why don't we keep doing this? And that's what a lot of people are talking about. Like, you know what, we're going to keep streaming because mm -hmm. we're doing it. And it's not that big a deal. Yeah. And then, exactly. you know. And eventually you can find people that you can, okay, you can take this over as part of your thing that you want to do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that is one of the more interesting conversations we have is like, yeah, you know, we're trying this, this works, this doesn't, and we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. One lady says she enjoyed going to church in her pajamas. You know, she, <laughs> like, you know, working in your pajamas, you know, you don't just have to go to church or you know, but she said she enjoyed, not this, enjoying going to church when she comes back, but. But just the idea, it was a more relaxed 
atmosphere for her. Mm -hmm. She didn't feel intimidated, you know, by a lady with the big hat, and she didn't have a big hat, you know. Kind of thing, so. yeah. yeah, I mean, just an interesting anecdote about that. There's a church in Fort Wayne I go to if I'm in at the seminary on a Sunday, and it's like a high churchy church, which is. It's neat because it's got all the stuff we could do in the liturgy. They just do it. Mm -hmm. It's real fancy. It's, it's fancy. Let's just call it that. But they have right in their bulletin, like, how to dress. And it's like, ooh, in this day and age, you're really doing that? I'm just grateful people are here. There's like, you know, uh, you know, men usually wear coat and tie and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, that's cool. And it's like, oh, and women wear big, beautiful hats. And there were big, beautiful hats. And these things are huge. And it's like, yeah, and then, you know, they wrote, it's divine service setting three, the one, you know, where we do the common service, but they wrote their own music to it, and you got to be able to read music to sing it the first time, because you're like, this is, it's beautiful, and they do it, like, they sing the gradual, they sing the verse, they sing everything they can, except the readings and the prayers, and it's like, look, it's really neat, and they're like, yeah, this is fancy, and then... I went to Bible study before. It was packed. There was a hundred people in Bible study. And I talked to one of them and said, how do you do this? Because it was like the, it was the solid declaration of the formula of concord. And they were talking about, uh, it wasn't even like justification or sanctification. It was one of the minor articles. that's like really dry and boring. It's like, these people are just, there's a hundred people there to listen to this. Like, how do you do this? I'm like, it took decades to do that. And everybody just, everybody that was in worship was in Bible study before. I was like, okay, that's no, that's like, this is depressing and amazing at the same time. And then, and of course, there's like a half a dozen seminary professors there because they got to go to church someplace on Sunday too. So they're all members there, but it's really neat. But it was like, okay, different culture, different culture. Uh, but you can just see how, you know, the Lord is working in a very different way there. And then I've got, uh, you know, a classmate that's out west. And, or I'm sorry, I've got another, take that back, I'll do this classmate. A classmate in Fort Wayne that's in my program, the distance program, for some reason, because he's in Fort Wayne where the seminary is. But his, his, his uh, specific ministry is he has an African immigrant church. And he's got about... 18 different languages these people speak. So, you know, like English is not their first one, although most folks in Africa do learn English as a second language uh, nowadays. But it, he's got people from like 18 different African nations in this church. Yeah, oh, oh, is it, isn't it Faith over on the west side? It might be. That has uh, quite a large African... Uh, Are we talking about here in Ohio? Yeah. Yeah, I think there is one out there. And uh, um, McAfee, that's the church he goes to. And uh, English, the second language, you mm -hmm. know, was one of the first things, you know, that they do. They have quite a large um, mission of, you know, that the families, you know, and getting jobs and mm -hmm. all of that. Anyway, the culture. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you just see people coming from a totally different culture. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they're, like, some of these guys are worshiping. I know one Lutheran church, it's a barber shop. And they throw white cloths over the chairs on Sunday afternoon, and they set up an altar on one of the tables, and they do the full divine service right there with no music or nothing. Everything's a cappella. And they do it reverently and beautifully. And they're grateful to have that church. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's okay. You look at that and go, what am I complaining about? Ugh, really? I mean, is that, wow. <laughs> kind of kind of slaps you in the face and goes, quit worrying about stupid stuff. So, yeah, you know, again, it, it depends. But people, they come out of that persecuted environment and suddenly have that freedom to practice their religion, albeit in a barbershop, they don't care. <laughs> they're just able to stand there and not be worried they're going to be arrested. Uh, same with Paul in Philippians. And then this psalmist again, I mean, he's a king. He's probably got a pretty good life, but he's also got a pretty good head on his shoulders because he recognizes Hey, life's not easy. I'm, I'm being persecuted, but you know what? The one thing that's a constant in my life is God. And I'm acknowledging that. I'm telling you, you know, you've dwelt well with your servant, 65, right? Before we started. Uh, and so that persecution again works to purify. Uh, you could almost jump from verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. And then you jump down to... Um, 
verse 71, it is good that I have been afflicted. <laughs> yep, absolutely. No, and then you go right to, you know, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word, which my, your word is repent and repent of your sins and then sin no more. And then that verse 68, because God is good and he only does good, um, even though he's suffering all this time, he keeps his head on straight, which folks don't. And a lot of people that should be in church aren't in church because they think God is just this spiteful, hateful evil guy like Luther did before he realized that, no, God's not actually like that. Uh, you know, so the psalmist is reemphasizing for us that God is good, everything he does is good, whatever he uses, he uses for good, even if it's not a good thing. You know, and he's not accusing God of creating the bad thing. Uh, so experiencing God's goodness reinforces what his word says, what God has taught him in his word, that God is good and that God is going to take care of him and that God is going to keep his promises because he can't not keep them. And then the arrogant have forged, he's got to get the, he's got to get the other guys in there, 69, the arrogant have forged a lie against me. But with all my heart, I will observe your precepts. And then altar had... Yeah, the arrogant plaster me with lies. And I just keep thinking of like people in the old, putting the old playbills up on the walls with the, you know, dunk it like wallpaper and <laughs> so this, the arrogant are plastering him with lies so that he's just getting covered with them. But I with whole heart keep your decrees. So it's not even a partial heart, it's his whole heart. And that's how for us to do it when we're being inflicted or persecuted or being spoken from somebody that's yeah. against us, it's hard to not retaliate and True. stoop to their level. And then the, the and then kind of partner to that is again, you know, when we're afflicted and when we finally kind of go, okay, I got no place else to turn. <laughs> then you don't just kind of half heartedly turn to God. It's like when you're desperate, you fully one hundred percent in that moment Go, okay, God, I'm laying it at your feet because I'm about done. And again, he expects that. With the, well, I guess not a caveat, but with the thought that, okay, now don't let it go so long next time. You know, keep, keep, him in your, in your, uh, keep him in your sights. You know, so even though he is being afflicted and he's still holding on to his commandments, he's holding on to his law, and again, a lot of times when they talk about the law, they're talking about law and gospel, as we would say. Uh, they're the whole of his word. It's not just like the Ten Commandments. Although a lot of times it is the Ten Commandments. But when he's talking about keeping the law, it means he's keeping the whole scope of what God has taught us, revealed to us in his, in his head. You know, so you've got the, the wicked people, the smug people, you know, the, the crowd out there that's trying to get him, would love to get him to turn. Why don't you be like us? You know, be like us and come worship all these false gods. And he won't. You know, he's being steadfast. And he's not bragging about it. You know, it's, he's not the one that's proud and arrogant. He's just laying it out going, Lord, you know, keep teaching me your statutes because I value them. I want to keep them. Um, these guys are plastering me with lies. Don't let me lose heart. You know, teach me good discernment and knowledge. And where was it? I just lost it. Where is it? We were at 69. 69? Yeah, the arrogant forge language. With all my heart, I will observe your precepts. And he's got, you know, I with whole heart keep your decrees. Their heart grows dull like that. But I delight in your teaching. And it was good for me, and we went over that already. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then the end of this piece, the end of this section just kind of repeats the same theme that where he's reaffirming the value of going through suffering. So it's not that he just wants the suffering to end, which he does, which we do, but. You know, he also goes, okay, there was a, I learned a lesson here. You taught me something through this. So he doesn't lose sight of that. And that's the, that's the part I think we miss sometimes. You know, God bails us out. He answers our prayers. 
but then we don't make the connection that, you know, if I just stay with you all the time, it's going to be like this all the time, even when I'm persecuted. Uh, to realize we're being taught something. Now, so again, he talks about the great value of this suffering. He's grateful for his affliction. It's been good for him. It's stirred him up. It has taught him the power of God's word in a different or greater way than it did ever before. So he's just, he sees the big picture. He sees how it's a circle where you, you come back. Uh, and maybe, maybe it's a spiral. You know, I know that God's word like, loves spirals. John loves spirals. So, you know, we, we have this cycle where we're good with God and then, okay, yeah, we're falling away a little bit and then, you know, persecution happens and that ups us this way again and now we're up here. But then as we learn and we mature, that's, we go around that circle, but we don't go as low as before. And maybe the next time we go a little shallower yet and eventually you're kind of like this, up at the top where this big circle before, you had to hit this big bottom before you turn back to God. And now we just kind of, oh yeah. This is the way it ought to be, because God's got my back all the time. So we're kind of, yeah, bad things happen, but yeah, I'm not worried about it. And we see examples of that. We, we all maybe know people that have done that, that go through that, or you just watch somebody go, how are, you know, how are you dealing with this? How are you, you know, like, uh, like Pastor Zeman. You know, his wife just died a couple weeks ago. It's only been like two weeks. And you're just like, I have never met a more godly woman or a sweeter woman in my life. It's like, oh, how could God take her? She was awesome. And he was, he was just going, is he going to like completely fall apart? I'm just watching him. You know, we we're worried about him. It's like, nobody's that strong. He is that strong. He, his faith is that solid that he just dealt with us. And he's like, if God takes her today, that's okay. And if we get to have her for another week, that's okay. Every day is a gift. And it, like he wasn't just saying that he lived it, and we're all just, and he sends out. We were sending out a text message every day. We we're all on the list, and we we're like sitting there going, oh, "What are we just doing today?" It's like he had her out walking like a mile. Really, she's got stage four cancer, but she's out there walking, and it's like right up. Like that was like the week before she died. I'm just sitting there going, "Okay, he's just like back to like this is nothing. That's just what they do." And then she passed, and it's like, "Okay, she's home." And he was actually still witnessing to people at the funeral because everybody's all weepy eyed, of course, because we lost our friend. And he's like, it's okay. <laughs> Going, man. But the family drew the line at him preaching the sermon at the funeral because he was going to do it. And I was like, I bet he's going to do it. Yeah, they told him, no, he's going to sit with the family in the pew. So he did. He had the vicar preach it and he wrote the sermon. That was his word. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what he did. And he told us right, in the, right when he started giving it, he goes, I didn't actually write most of the sermon because, you know, Pastor Zeman wrote it. This is his way of getting to preach it. He said, <laughs> everybody laughed. He's like, that was smart. <laughs> but yeah, he actually lived, lives his faith like that. Like, holy cow. So I thought he was just being strong for everybody, but then he's going to be vaunting. No, no. To this day, he's still rock solid. So you do see some people like that, you know, that can really be your example. Uh, and that's kind of what the, what the psalmist is doing. So I think that thinking of that spiral that just doesn't bottom out as far each time, maybe. Sometimes, yeah, we're still going to bottom out bad, but then we wind it back up again. So that at the end of the day, what God gave him in his word was of far more value than the cost, because we talked about cost at the beginning. Everything comes at a cost, but... The value he got from God's word was higher in value than what it cost him in affliction is the way I think we can summarize this section. So, yeah, there was a cost. I had, I had to suffer to learn this lesson, but you know what? The lesson learned is far more valuable than that suffering I just went to. You know, and that's what I think we see again in a parallel with Paul. You know, whatever that thorn is that in his side that God gave him, we don't know what the thorn was. Uh, some say it's a demon. Uh, some don't go that far and just say it was something medical wrong with him, uh, which is maybe why he palled around with Luke so much, since he was a doctor. Uh, but, you know, it, everything he counted as gain, everything was counted as gain for the Lord. Not, you know, he's just the vessel, a broken vessel, as he would say. 
Uh, so yeah, so the value he gets from God's word is greater than any cost that came to him. And the Hebrews 12, 11, Hebrews would be a good Bible study, I think. It's hard, but it's worth it. Because there is a lot of good stuff in Hebrews. You just can't, can't, uh, I can't find anything tonight. What's wrong with me? Turn. Uh, Hebrews, I'm thinking 12, 11 ish. So, I'm going to back up to nine. Actually. No, I'm going to back all the way up to seven. Because this is talking about a father's discipline, and then they're quoted that Jesus is our example of father's discipline. And then it's quoting there in 5 and 6. What are we quoting? 12, 5, and 6. Proverbs. Do, 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 do. Yeah, Proverbs. Proverbs. Yeah. 11 and 12. Okay. Yep. So then we have the quote from Proverbs, and you hit end of verse 7, is for discipline that you endure, God deals with you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Good point. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet. So it's the same thing that we've been talking about, where, okay, if a good father does this for his child, because the child has to learn, how much more is God, who is the father and creator of all, going to have to discipline us too, but it's going to be for an even greater advantage. And that's, that's probably it for that section, I think. And then again, he reinforces at the end, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces of which the king of Israel surely had much wealth, right? So all, that, all the worldly goods, all the trappings of being a king, that's nothing. What he, the value he gets out of God's word, that's infinite. So this, this little bit of suffering, which is probably a lot of suffering, but this, what he's going to call a little bit of suffering was for his own good. Uh, what is that? Um, and when he has tried me, I will be like much refined gold. I don't know where that is. I'm great at quoting scripture, horrible at telling you where it is. I want to say it's John. Then I know Isaiah talks about jewels forged in fire. Okay, any questions about that section? That's a good section. I like the last uh, verse 79. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. It's like, okay, you know, let me be a good... Let me, let me be the gospel to those that, uh, because of my affliction, what I have learned and what now I can teach them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're not going to have time to go through that whole section tonight. We'll pick that up next week instead of blasting forward through all this. But let's talk about those couple of verses, which I have notes on somewhere. Where did I put it? Uh, oh, here we go. So that you are... Yeah, may those who fear you turn to me, even those who know your testimonies. What does your verse 79 say? I'm sorry? What does your verse 79 say? Uh, let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your, uh, those, and there are common, than those who know your testimonies. Okay, this is more or less. Right let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. Right. Yeah, so he, this one is for, you know, now he prayed for himself. And then in this next section is going to be more about his, so that was his relationship with the law and his relationship with God. And then this section is going to be his relationship with God and his law and his relationship with his neighbor or his subjects since he's a king. So, okay, how do these interact? And there's a real lesson in there for us too because we don't interact with 
our churchly family like we should all the time. Right, so he's going to pray that those who really know him and really understand him, him would turn to him, the psalmist. The psalmist. Uh, not quite sure what he means by that. Uh, are they going to turn to him for inspiration, turn to him for leadership? We kind of got to read between the lines a little bit. Uh, and I would, I would think that it would be, given the history of, of what was happening with these people, it's like, okay, he's the king. I'm convinced that it's one of the king, you know, that it's David that wrote this, even though it doesn't say David. Uh, but you just think he's the king. Now he wants those who also fear and understand and appreciate God's law to look to him as a beacon, as an inspiration, as an example of what to do and what not to do. Uh, David's a great example of what not to do sometimes. Um, So we're not quite sure why he wants them to turn other than they're all children of God. They all need to do this with the law. Maybe he's equating himself with that one. We'll have to study that one a little more. You got a note on that? Well, I don't have a note, but mine's worded just a little differently. In 78, it says, make proud people ashamed because they lied about me. Okay. But I but I will think about your orders and then let those who respect you return to me. I'm thinking that, okay, they lied about him, but now that they know what's right, God's rules, okay. they're going to have a different attitude about him. That sounds right. And maybe be uh, more respectful of him. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Again, you know, you look at the context there where... What the people kept doing was going to those other, you know, they're surrounded by all these pagans. And, you know, they're, they really want to adopt their culture because it looks like they're having fun. Uh, you know, they're worshiping all these, you know, the Baals and all the false gods. And they're more worldly than God's people because they have all these rules they have to follow. Uh, so now you've got these people who, okay, they lied about him before, but now they know the truth, like you said. So now he hopes that they will turn to him and they will turn away from right. all these temptations. So again, yeah, he's praying for, praying for his neighbors. Um, and he's also saying, talk about his heart. Yeah, so that he remains blameless. Yeah, we're going to talk about that, one, that section more next week. And we'll just leave with this thought and we'll pick it back up next week. And this is a note from a book I have that uh, the psalmist asks five requests and we'll want to try to pick these out. Now we first, the first one we kind of heard tonight so that God's steadfast love will comfort and encourage us because that's what the psalmist is praying for. And then that God's acts of compassion will sustain us. And then that we will remain focused on God's word in the midst of our trials. I'm sorry, that's the one from tonight. And then that our lives and faithfulness would strengthen God's people, which is what this next section is alluding toward. And then that we would not veer from obeying God's word, but rather be blameless in all things, which that's worded a little funny, but you know, that we would not, they will not veer from obeying God's word and be aware of our sin when we do is the way I would rephrase that. So definitely the remaining focus on God's word in the midst of trial is where we were tonight. Yes, yeah, so we'll talk about this next section some more next week. It's a quarter after eight already. But I do like that, that very last verse. And then, uh, may the arrogant be ashamed for that they subvert, subvert me with a lie. You know, again, hoping that that those who spoke poorly of him, now again, that they know what God's law says, that they will, you know, turn. We turn in repentance to God, and then we also turn in repentance to, to neighbor. You know, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Oh. One of the cross references for that is Second uh, Timothy uh, three, verse sixteen. All scripture is given and in, uh, by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. Yep. That the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. Yep. 
No, that's, that's good, Paul, right there. The pastoral epistles are pretty good. Um, sometimes they're a little hard to read in church because they're, 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 like, they're letters from a bishop to the pastor, to like Timothy, or young pastors, in case may be. So sometimes it's, there's things in there that really only apply to clergy sometimes. It gets, that's probably why you don't hear too many people preaching on it. But there's a lot of good advice and good uh, gospel in those. Yeah, so the five, the five requests that we can look at, you know, and we can, we'll just outline this real good and then we'll talk about it a little more next week. So that this, this section from 76 to 80, you've got five requests so that God's love, his unfailing love will comfort you just as he promises, that his compassion surrounds and protects you because his word is what you delight in, and then that the arrogant be shamed, that your experience or your testimony be an encouragement to others and that you might be blameless in obeying his word and never again be shamed. Um, which is what it says. You know, they've got this, this Hebrew word tamen, which is uh, that, you're, that you would be sound, you know, like fit or be blameless uh, so that you would be following God's word inwardly and outwardly um, which that's a tough that's a tough word you know because we're asking to be perfected and we know we will be perfected not yet but one day that's always a hard hard one to talk about but hopefully we put off you know, some of our bad habits or some of our, we haven't see there we go, we're calling it a bad habit instead of calling it sin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but some of these you know, different sins that we have in our lives as we get older, you know, we can let go of some of that stuff, but then it seems like we pick up new ones or, or what have you. So we'll talk, yeah, we'll pick that up next week because there's good stuff in this section too. And then, and then probably the next section from, so 73 through 88. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, 73 through 88 next week. Questions, comments, anything? I didn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Oh. <laughs> Otherwise. All right, well, that's where we'll stop for tonight, I guess. No, you can ask questions about anything, too. So I always liked, I always liked teaching like the high school kids on Sunday mornings because I did, I always did things like, Gee, ask me anything you want about church, like stump me, give me something I got to look up, you know. And they would ask oddball stuff, and then I, you would sit there and go, what? Why in the world did you think of that? And you know, that's a really good question. So they're like, I got to get back to you next week on that. Yeah. We'll stop off. I found this interesting book. It's an English translation of Luther's sermons from 1578. It's really unusual for it to be in English and be that old. But it's like 1578 English. It's almost like reading a foreign language. Because, you know, they just kind of spelled stuff the way it sounded. And it was okay, and then they got some real, they get the long S's that look like F's. So you keep trying to mispronounce just about everything. But it's really weird. And then the commentary is in German black letter font, the Frachter font, even though it's in English. If you're looking at it going, that stuff's hard enough to read in English. It's not any easier in English than it is in German. Mm-hmm. But it's a neat. Need to see a translation from that long. That's like 440 years. But a lot of people don't realize the Bible was translated in English before it was translated. Everybody, especially Lutherans, think, oh, the first time the Bible wasn't Latin anymore was when Luther did it in German. That's not true. They had it in English a long time before that. And uh, all those guys got burned at the stake for doing it, too. So. English, the English people must have been very powerful about that time for their language to have been one of the pre- predominant languages. 
Yeah, and the, well, I don't know there, the there's, history, some, so. there's some interesting reasons why English is kind of where it is today, like it's kind of become the universal language. During the Enlightenment, which is coming right after the Reformation time, uh, during the Enlightenment, English became the language of, of science because nobody spoke it. So it was like, you know, everybody spoke Latin because the church used it, scholars used it. Everybody spoke Latin, or read Latin, uh, pretended to be able to say it. So they started writing in English because nobody can read this, so it's almost like writing it in code. Uh, so that became, that became the kind of vernacular language for science throughout the world. Uh, but yeah, the English, the church, was real, especially once the Reformation really kicked off, because then it kicked off in, in England too, uh, because they were still Roman Catholic. Uh, so it was still, everything's in Latin. And then, of course, the king wanted a divorce. Pope wouldn't give him a divorce. So he goes, okay, I'm going to found my own religion. Boom. Now we have Anglicanism. And now, oh, guess what? We're going to start doing the service in English. And there you go. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that was kind of powerful for them to have their own language like that. And then it just took hold. Uh, there's more to it than that, of course. But, yeah, uh, yeah, those guys like John Huss, you'll see mention of him in a lot of the Luther biography movies. Uh, you know, he got burned in the stake. And then Wycliffe, that's like the Wycliffe Bible foundation that bears his name. You know, he was burned at the stake, and then they buried him, and then they dug his bones up and burned him again and scattered him in the river. Because I guess he was a really bad heretic. But they did not like them putting the, the Bible in the language of the people. And when I was in convent school, uh, we at Latin with mass every day and do the Latin thing. After two years, when I came home, I couldn't say the Lord's Prayer in English. And not only that I couldn't say it, I had to sing it. Mm. I couldn't it. Took me a while to kind of get back to it. That was funny. Yeah, I mean, you know, so how many times a day did you actually say the Lord's Prayer? Was it eight? Twice. Oh, it was only twice? Yeah. Nice. So the way the poor old monks had to do it was eight times a day. But they'd get up in the middle, I mean, just get to sleep, and you had to wake up in the middle of the night, go into the sanctuary and sing again, and then go back to bed. Like, those guys awake. But that's probably why so many monasteries developed really good tea, really good coffee, uh, places they had coffee, and then brewed outstanding beer. Because <laughs> bad have something to get them back to sleep, and then something to wake them up. All right, we'll leave her there. Uh, we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. In English. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.